Thanks for taking the time attending this talk. So we, I'm going to talk about like how to make a big data platform and specifically make it extensible. Uh, so my name is Reza. Uh, I did my PhD in computer science in the University of Illinois. I've been with Uber since 2014. So when I joined Uber, it was like a still star, a small startup company. So our data was so small that it was still fitting into a one, like one big Postgres table. But we saw that the business is growing so fast, the data is growing exponentially. So we knew we had to invest in a big data platform. And this talk is actually a summary of our journey towards building that platform. Uh, so the talk, I, I'll summarize it with a quick, uh, the, the basic, the talk is going to start with a small touch on how we get started on the big, building the big data platform. I'll start, I'll try to spend most of the time on the current architecture and how we made it like basically flexible enough to be extensible. And then I will touch on some of the ongoing issues, what we are working on right now. And I'll try to wrap it up by some of the key learnings from this journey. So Uber's mission is to provide transport, transportation as reliable as running water to everyone, everywhere. To this end, we are operating in over 700 cities across the world, 75 plus countries, and with 2 million plus driver partners, and we're still growing. On the infrastructure side, on data side, this means that we have huge amount of data being generated on a daily basis. We have to store and serve the, those data to the rest of the company. Uh, internally, we categorize our data users into three main categories. So we have city operators. These are the folks, the underground crew that operate each city. So these guys, there are several thousand of them managing different cities. And these guys need uh, to run their cities. So they need ad hoc query access to all this big data to be able to answer different questions, to make decisions for their own cities. On the other hand, we have data scientists, data analysts. These are the, basically the guys who study the data in basically the, the trend of data, the changes in data over time. So they usually look at long period of times and they try to find patterns, they try to t test out different ideas. The idea is to basically find new products that we can ship new features or improve the existing ones. And we are having a few, several hundreds of those across the company. A good example. At least how we should spend our marketing budgets, how we, how, how we can better forecast the demand supply in different cities at different times. So these are the types of questions that these guys try to answer. The third categories of the use data users at Ubers are the engineering teams. These are the teams across the company that build products that relies on these data to serve for a specific business needs. Uh, a good example is like, for example, fraud detection or the incentive payments to the drivers or as simple as onboarding new drivers or new writers. So we also have hundreds of engineering teams across the company building products on top of our data. So the first, our, the first effort we had in terms of building a big data platform was basically in 2015, early 2016, that we built like a, uh, a basic big data, real big data platform. We had multiple iterations before that. I gave a talk earlier in San Francisco in terms of how we get here. If you interested about learning about the history, you can listen to that talk. You can see this one as a follow-up on that talk. It's most focused on, mostly focused on what we currently have and what challenges we have and how we made it basically flexible. So this was the basically first um, big data platform that we built. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see different data sources. Uh, we have our transactional online data world. Uh, these, da these transactions are stored in some online data stores. Mostly they are sharded based on some UAD. Uh, so all this data, we also basically use Kafka as a, as a message buffer across the company. It's like we try to, uh, we standardize on that since 2014. And it was actually very popular across the company and it was horizontally scalable. So we stayed with that. So these are the source of data that we received uh, from uh, different online board and we had a bunch of we made basically added a bunch of spark jobs a bunch of um, ingestion custom jobs to bring all this data into Hadoop. So the whole ecosystem is built around Hadoop. Uh, we made a few decisions at the beginning. One was uh, we decided to not let users uh, transform, make any changes to the data when the data is being ingested. So that's why it's called EL. So we ingest the data in the raw format as is. The idea was you ingest once and let users do whatever they want in Hadoop in a batch format. So if they have any issues or anything, you ingest the data once. It reduces the pressure on the upstream data sources. At the same time, if there's any issue with the transformation, you are in the Hadoop world so you can actually add more resources and run the job faster. So we ingest the data uh, through, and we decided on Spark frameworks. 
So that's one of the early bets we put uh, in 2014. Spark was in early stages. It turns out to be a good one because it's become a popular uh, framework for batch processing. Uh, we enforced schema. We decided to use uh, Parquet. So we decided to, uh, we needed a column of file formats. Our data is basically have a lot of columns. It's like several level, level of nesting. So we needed a column of file formats to store them in the optimized, most compact format in the HDFS. At the same time, for serving the queries, a column of file formats helps you serve the queries more efficiently. So we decided to go with Parquet. And then we moved all the modeling, all the transformation uh, in, within the Hadoop. So you can see that the data lands in Hadoop in Parquet format and then the modeling happens here. Uh, on the query side, uh, we open up a few query engines to the user to decide which one they want to go with. Uh, we, on one hand, we have Hive, uh, which is like basically the workhorse. It's always good to, good to have a reliable uh, query engine that can run the query regardless of the volume of data. We also provide Spark, uh, which basically for users who need uh, programmatic access to the data. They can use Spark Framework to play around with the data. And we also added Presto and Notebooks. Presto was geared mostly towards users who need interactive queries. And Notebooks is mostly geared towards a data scientist. At the same time, so this is for all the users who want to access the data and run queries against Hadoop directly. Uh, we also uh, have those city ops that needs to run queries, but very small queries, mostly on recent data, and they want fast response time. Uh, basically, okay, so this was the first architecture, our first efforts towards building a big data platform. It's a very, like, it's not, nothing uh, like specific about it. It's a standard like data, big data platform that all the big companies uh, build in the Bay Area. Uh, so I'll skip this one to save sometimes. Uh, I'll get to the big means. So with this platform, we made Hadoop as a source of tools for all analytical data. Basically, for the first time, we had all our analytical data in one place. So people had the, the different engineering teams had the options to join these data across each other. They could go back as much as they want. So everything in one place. And this was this made actually Hadoop very popular across the company. Uh, the uh, basic, and uh, because of that, a lot of new use cases start using Hadoop. At the same time, it means, okay, more data was needed to be ingested. So the use case were going up, the data was going up, the, the scalability issues start showing up. And then, but the good thing is, most of the components in the platform were scalable. Uh, when I say scalable, horizontally scalable, and to some degree. Uh, so it gave us some time to think about what we need to build in long term. To give you some sense in terms of the numbers, so we are talking about a, a few tens of petabytes of data in HDFS, a few tens of terabytes per day of new data coming in. Our Hadoop cluster was around like 10,000 B cores. Uh, we had around 100,000 uh, like batch jobs running per day. But again, this was just the beginning. A bit more use cases, more data. The, the whole thing was exponentially still growing. So one thing I skipped was the fact that we built this platform. It lets us have all the data in one place. Uh, we had a few tens of petabytes of data. It was, we were able to store them and serve them to the users. Uh, the only issue was the data latency, the data freshness was still over 24 hours. And the reason for that is if you look at this picture, uh, you can see on our data online data, store, data stores at the left. So these are having, for example, let's think about our TRIPS data sets. So TRIPS gets uh, stored in these online transactional databases, and then we have a stream of uh, change logs coming into Hadoop. Uh, so this stream of change log keeps coming in. Uh, the problem was we had a lot of updates. So uh, our data by nature has a lot of updates on the historical data. Hadoop uh, is basically mostly geared towards append only. So you dump the data and then you deal with that. Specifically, we were using Parquet, which is a columnar file format. So you can't go and update a single record in your previous files. So what we had, we had to find a way to absorb all these updates in one shot. Uh, the way we did it was we, we basically uh, used HBase in between. What the way we were doing it was we get the stream of these change logs. We were updating these records in HBase, and every few hours we make a new snapshot out of HBase. We convert that to Parquet, bring it into Hadoop, swap the two tables. This was working fine. Uh, the problem is like basically you are ingesting the whole data set because of some changes. So when we started in January 2016, these snapshot creation and Parquet conversion was taking around six, six hours. With Hadoop becoming more popular, the data size growing, we soon in a few months, we, the job was running 10 hours with double the amount of resources, so it was not scalable. Uh, and because of that, the whole thing was taking basically, two, like we couldn't ingest more than once or twice per day. And then on top of this, you have the modeling. When you have your source tables, like 
ingested as a snapshot, you are basically swapping the table with a new one every 12 hours, which means your modeling has to happen again from scratch. So you have to do an, another snapshot modeling at, at the end too. So the whole thing resulted in more than 24 hours data latency for the users. This was a big achievement as we have all the data in one place, but the data was basically too slow for our use cases. Uber's use case by nature is very real time. Cities need to make decisions in very, like, very few minutes or few hours. They can't wait for 24 hours for new data to arrive. So this was one of the big, uh, big concerns and feedbacks from the users that we had to address this. So if you want to summarize the limitations from our first uh, data platform, uh, big data platform effort, first thing is scalability. As I said, for example, HDFS is scalable. What scalable means to some degree. You can easily use it out of the box for 10, 20 petabytes of data. Beyond that, it starts showing all its limitations. You will start seeing all the small files taking putting a lot of pressure on the name nodes. At the same time, our ingestion jobs were also ad hoc uh, Spark jobs that people were writing, uh, writing to get the data in. So it works fine when you have a few hundreds of tables to be ingested, a few thousand. When you get uh, above 10,000, 20,000, you can't have custom jobs ingesting the data. It's too fragile. The operational overhead is way too much. At the same time, the data latency was too high, so we had 24 hours a wait time for the users to get fresh data. Uh, updates was becoming a problem. At the same time, we have late arriving data. What if a trip takes more longer than uh, we expect to show up at the source? Then we had late arriving data. And this was basically causing a lot of uh, problems for the system. At the end, and finally, the ETL was also a snapshot. So our ingestion, raw data ingestion was snapshot. It was uh, 24 hours. And then ETL has to happen after that. So it was basically very problematic. So this, this, these were main ideas that we were trying to redesign our architecture, the, the second one that we currently are using, running in production. To give you some sense in terms of the numbers that we were talking about, so in early 2017, we had several hundred petabytes of data in HDFS. Our Hadoop cluster was growing to a few hundred thousand B cores. There were several hundred thousand uh, batch jobs and queries running on a daily basis. And again, this business was growing. We, this is the time that we introduced, like Uber Eats was basically pay, taking up. So if you want to consider, consider that, we had the Uber trips going on, and then Uber Eats was adding up, Uber Freight was coming up, so there are business, new businesses coming in, and the amount of data was still growing exponentially. So the main motivation was at this time, we saw that for the first time, okay, we have some headrooms to, to, to study our data sets and decide what we really need to build, something that's extensible and something that's going to last us for long term. Uh, so the main limitation that we were trying to address first was HDFS scalability. So this, again, the, uh, almost all the companies who has data beyond a few tens of petawatts would start seeing these problems. Name knows is almost always guaranteed to be the, the, the root cause for this. Uh, the problem, uh, the, the, the good thing is this is a known problem. So a lot of companies have faced this problem before. So there are, it's, it's, it's not a, it's easy solution, it's not an easy problem to fix, but it's a straightforward problem to fix. So you can follow the experience from other companies. Basically, you have to use some way of uh, federating your name nodes. Uh, there are different ways to do that, but by separating your namespaces, you, you basically reduce, you spread the name node pressure across multiple uh, boxes instead of one, and then that gives you headrooms. It gets, lets you scale beyond a few hundred uh, tera petabytes. Uh, so I'll skip the details here, but we have a nice engineering blog on this. Uh, if you are interested about the details, you can go and read that. Uh, the second problem that we were having was basically people, uh, all our uh, use cases within the company, they need fresh data. They need the data to be there as fast as possible. At the same time, we knew that our data set has a lot of updates and deletes, and we need to address those within HDFS and on top of Parquet. Uh, at, again, I got this question a lot that why didn't you replace Parquet with something else? Because again, our data set is extremely large. We have a lot of columns in each data coming in. We have five, six level of nesting data. So there's no way to bypass the column not five formats. You can replace Parquet with something else, but it's the same problem. You still have to address the uh, update and delete issues on top of those column not five formats. And finally, we had to make our ETL more efficient. We can't keep doing snapshot-based ingestion, snapshot-based uh, modeling. We have to make those efficient and fast, and we have to move to incremental model. So uh, oh, uh, this, this is a good slice for, to, uh, to fully understand what I mean when I said our data set. When, I, when we looked at those and studied those, we saw that by nature they have updates. So there are companies that they have data coming in, for example, user click stuff. These data, when they say updates, is mostly late arriving data. Our data set is that we're actually having real updates. So think about our trips data sets. 
when a trip happens, uh, this, this is like the data sets, the source data sets at the left, and you can see the Hadoop data on the right. So when we ingest all the trips data sets into Hadoop, we partition those based on the trip dates uh, at day level. Uh, so most of the trips are new trips. These are the new ones, the, the green bars that you can see that are added at the end. So the new trips, easy, new trips gets added at the end. The problem is like, for example, like we, you, you have a trips happening for you today, uh, the fare is let's say $15. So that gets uh, recorded as a green box. Then you have a problem with that trip, so you support the sub, uh, you submit a support ticket, they look at it, they say, oh, there's something wrong, so they change the price back to let's say $5. But this is an update. It can happen like the fare change that usually happens within a few days, or it can happen basically on a longer time base. For example, uh, riders, the rate their drivers next time they take a ride. So if you don't take a ride every day, if you take a, a ride every week, every month, you're gonna rate your driver from last month, last week. So you're gonna have an update on previous trips data uh, based on the nature of the data. And this is these orange boxes that I'm showing here. Obviously, the amount of updates keeps going down as you go back in time, but there's a long tail of updates. Six months, one year, we see updates happening uh, one year ago all the time. Uh, so how did we do that? Uh, we introduced a new uh, basic product, a library called Hoodie. Uh, Hoodie stands for Hadoop Upsets and Delete Incrementals. It's a basically a storage abstraction that lets you do two things. First, it lets you apply upsert and delete on top of the columnar file data of Parquet in HDFS. First, se second thing, it, it lets the user, think about the users who needs to read these data out. Uh, so one thing is to be able to absorb these updates and delete that are coming in. The second thing, if you are a user uh, and you, there is an update on a trips from, let's say, one year ago, how can the user know about that? Uh, the users can keep doing the full table scan and finding all these updates. That's a very expensive uh, query operations. So uh, what we want to provide them is something called incremental pool, which means on the user side and the reader side, they can pull out only the change data regardless of when that happens in time. So even if you have one trip from one year ago updated, users can fetch only that one record without scanning the whole table. So these are the two functionalities that had the Hoodie library provides. It's a Spark-based library, so it's basically scale, uh, it horizontally scalable. It only relies on HDFS to operate, so you don't need any other dependency other than HDFS, and it's open source. So if you are interested in trying it out, you can check the code at GitHub. Uh, we have a blog post on that, and we gave a lot of talks about the details. So feel free to check it out if needed. Uh, so now let's look at, have a look at the, uh, the data architecture platform after we introduced 2D and we moved from snapshot based ingestion to incremental mode. On the left, you can still see the data sources. And so there's a stream of change log coming into Kafka. So we standardize on Kafka as the handover between the, uh, the online databases and the, the analytical boards. So you, we have a, a batch job, ingestion jobs, that runs, let's say, every 15 minutes, 10 minutes. And it gets these change logs. The good thing is with Hoodie, it can now go and update the previous data. It doesn't need to recreate the whole table and swap the tables. So Hoodie allows us to basically reduce the ingestion time from over 24 hours to basically 15 to 30 minutes. The first effort, we start with 30. Now we are running at 15 minutes, and we are aiming for five minutes by the end of the year. Uh, so that's on the ingestion of the raw data. Then, uh, then on the modeling side, so same thing. So the modeling jobs can incrementally pull these changes, only the change data using the Hoodie readers out of the Hadoop, and they can actually go and update their previous table using Hoodie Writer uh, with the same approach. So end-to-end uh, -end data latency was reduced um, from over 24 hours to less than 30 minutes for raw data and one hour for the model, sorry, model tables. And the data size was growing from, uh, from 10 petabytes to over 100 petabytes. Okay, so uh, traditionally, again, uh, one thing I skipped in the, in the introduction was the fact that, okay, Lambda architecture we are all familiar with, there's a streaming part, there's a batch part. So we also have the same thing. We have a streaming services, we have the batch words. I was mostly focusing on the batch words, and the part that I'm focusing on is the, basically the space between these two. So the problem with Lambda architecture is users are confused when to use streaming, when to, uh, to use batch. There's a blurry line in between. 
by default, everyone knows if you need, for example, one minute, two minutes to access to data, you go with streaming. If you can wait a few hours and then access the data, you go with batch. But what about the use cases? A wide range of use cases are lying between these two. So these are the, the use cases that we are trying to target. And we, uh, we call this approach incremental uh, mini batch processing. So any use case between five minutes and one hour is a perfect use case for this. You have the power of batch, which means your job is running as a batch job. You have access to all historical data. So the streaming side, you have to know the queries ahead of time. And you basically, the query, ex uh, the query cost itself Sorry, the execution, the processing cost itself is pretty high because you have to process the messages one at a time. You have to scan the whole data. So it's pretty expensive in terms of running the query. The good thing with batch is that you're running on top of column of five formats. So you only read what you need. And with incremental fetch, you can only fetch out the change data, the part that you care about. So this is the, uh, the, 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 the wide range of use cases that we, that we were trying to focus on. Okay, so uh, and, uh, yeah, so basically, any query that you want to run, regardless of whether you are in the streaming or batch, you should consider three things. One is what's the latency for the data to be there, what's the completeness of a data you are running against, and what's the cost of that, what's the hardware cost to run that query against. And if you look at these three parameters, you can basically break down all different use cases that you have with with the pure streaming uh, use cases pure bat traditional batch jobs, and most of them fit in between, somewhere in between, which we call them incremental mini batch processing. Uh, the other thing that we did uh, as part of this new architecture uh, was the fact that we tried to standardize everything. One uh, issue that we had before was we had a lot of ad hoc custom jobs for ingestion of the data, how we basically expose the data to the users. As part of the redesigned architecture, we tried to get rid of all these exceptions. We tried to standardize everything. Uh, one thing we did and turned out to be a good uh, decision was the fact that we standardized a raw data model. So I keep mentioning that these online data stores, they, they provide us with a stream of change log. Look at this, for example. We have uh, row key one, column one, value A. Then we, at time T1, we get column two, value B, column two, value C, column one, value D. So at the data stores, at the upstream data stores, depending on when you look at it, you can see different values for column A and B on the specific key. When this stream of change log gets into Hadoop, we provide two standard, basically, Hive tables, uh, data models. Uh, one is one we call change log history table. This is the history of all these change logs. And the other one is a merge snapshot table that only, that depending on when you look at it, it always shows you the, the latest merge snapshot values. The good thing with this approach is that the users who care about the, a specific column or who cares about the changes of a specific column can have access to the change log history table. And the one who cares about the latest value can go and use the merge snapshot tables. Uh, one additional feature that Hoodie provides is the fact that it basically it provides atomic transactional exposure of data. So you ingest one batch of data and it doesn't reveal it to the users till you basically do a submit. So it basically you can absorb a bunch of data and basically reveal it to the user all at once. And with that we can have snapshots that are moving in batches. So we have basically it's the same thing as MVCC model. Uh, another improvement that we did to the platform as part of the redesign was to get rid of all those custom ad hoc Spark jobs. Again, it was working fine when we had a few tens, hundreds, thousand tables. When we had over 20, 30,000 tables to be ingested, we can't have custom jobs to ingest that. First, it's not scalable. The operational cost is basically very high. And second, they are very fragile. Anytime there is a schema change or something, the jobs are breaking. So we had a team of like huge number, like 10, 20 people, basically just fit, fit, uh, patching this stuff. And there were always uh, complaints from the users because the jobs were fragile and always breaking. So one thing we did was to get rid of all those basic custom jobs and build up frameworks that basically uh, it provides a generic any-to-any -any data platform, a data move around. Uh, so uh, again, this is one mistake that a lot of company makes that they don't dis uh, distinguish the f between ad hoc Spark jobs and a platform. When you say a platform, you have no room for exceptions, which means you def def uh, basically you build plugins uh, to connect to different sources and to cover uh, to uh, different things, and then you let the data flows regarding. Oops, sorry. Regardless of how many tables are flying, uh, are flowing. 
So uh, using this uh, frameworks, we basically provide two services to the rest of the company. Was, was, uh, was, one was the ingestion that brings all the data from all these different sources into Hadoop. And the second one was the data dispersal that lets users take the derived data sets, whatever they generate in Hadoop, back to the online data source if they want to serve live traffic. Think about, for example, uh, the case of Uber Eats. So they have online transactional data stores that the, any order gets recorded there. They bring these data into Hadoop. They run a machine learning model within Hadoop uh, to uh, generate recommendations for users based on their previous interaction on I think daily basis. And they take that model out using the dispersal frameworks back to their online data stores so they can serve live traffic next time the users log in. So this provides a basically end-to-end comprehensive solution that you can gives users flexibility to do whatever they want. We build the infrastructure, let the users do whatever they want on top of that. Uh, OK. Uh, the good thing is, uh, this, the, this any, any data, again, we try to open source as much as we can. So as of a few weeks ago, we have also open source our, uh, this any to any data move around platform. It's called Marmaray. If you guys want to check it out, it's available on GitHub. We just uh, published the uh, engineering blogs on that, and we gave a talk at Strata. If you want to look it up, give it a try. Uh, so it's pretty early stages, but we are aggressively pushing for that. So if you need the platforms to move stuff around, give it a try. Uh, it provides both ingestion to Hadoop and dispersal out of Hadoop, and it's very pluggable. So you can add your own specific source or your uh, specific sync, and it moves the data between those two for you transparently. It's based on Spark, so it's uh, horizontally scalable, and it runs on top of Hadoop. Okay, so. Uh, okay, so now let's look at some of the problems that we are currently dealing with. First is like data quality. I skipped a lot of stuff about schema part. We invested in enforcing schema from 2014, from the very early stages. And it turns out to pay very well for us because when the data gets into Hadoop, it's of high quality. Uh, the, the problem is uh, we, we only have schemas enforced on the formats and type of data. For example, specific field has to be integer. Uh, that is very basic guarantee that we need to get the data in. Our current effort is trying to move beyond the type and structural check towards semantic checks, which means, for example, if you have a fair for a tree, it can't have a negative value. So if I define it an integer, it doesn't, uh, uh, it doesn't enforce the fact that it should be a positive number. So we are moving beyond that. This was a very basic one. But we are moving beyond um, type and structural check to semantic checks. At the same time, we used to have two traditional words. Uh, it's very typical at all, all the companies that they have an online words and they have an analytical offline words. So the problem is the link between these two are most of the time broken. What we are right now focusing on is trying to unify our uh, basically service RPC, the, RP, uh, the online word, with the analytical words, both in terms of schema and how they interact with each other. So these would significantly improve our data quality. Uh, the other issue, the other efforts that we are working on is in terms of providing faster data. So I keep saying that, okay, we moved from 24 hours to 15 to 30 minutes at this point, but our users are actually uh, needing more fresher data, uh, specifically with moving more streaming jobs toward these uh, uh, interactive uh, Batch, mini batch mode, uh, the users need more, uh, more fresh data. So we are basically focusing on uh, new uh, hoodie improvements to bring the data latency down to five to 10 minutes. Uh, the next big monster is the efficiency. So with your data growing, uh, the hardware cost starts going up. So you will get very like uh, chunky bills uh, in terms of the hardware cost. Uh, so you need to invest in improving the efficiency. Uh, and, and again, we try to improve our data storage format, our ingestion jobs. So we did all those stuff. One thing that we are focusing right now is to uh, inc increase the utilization of our hard bits. Yarn usually takes care of the Hadoop resource management for you. We also use Mises for our online transaction uh, on online services. What we are working right now is to have one unified resource scheduler that can work within Hadoop and across all these online uh, services. Uh, we are planning to open source it, uh, I think, next year. Uh, so it's called Peloton, uh, which basically is a unified resource scheduler that works both for Hadoop as well as the other services running uh, outside Hadoop. Uh, so there is, again, uh, we have another talk on that if you want to check it out. Uh, Hoodies, we're still in, uh, actively developing it. Uh, again, we are 
aiming for larger parquet files. So right now, we are basically getting to one GB files. We want to go beyond that. Again, HDFS has name node issues, so there's a cost with uh, having small files. So the larger files, uh, the the, the less pressure on the name nodes and more scalability within HDFS. At the same time, uh, we want to basically be more efficient in terms of absorbing the updates. Uh, so let me see if I have time to get that. Uh, so I give a quickly pass on this slide. I'll give you just a taste, but we can talk in the office hour afterwards if you have questions. So basically, what we have in Hoodie. Uh, internally, uh, it's a technology called, we call it copy and write, which means you have these parquet files at, at the core. Parquet files are append only. B sorry, it's, uh, it's uh, read only. So you can't go and update or append to those. What we did is when there is an update, we create another copy of the files, we absorb the updates by writing the, the files, and we version these files. And then we, this is how we initially absorbed all these updates within Hoodie. The problem with that is you want to have larger parquet files, so your file starts growing from 128 to 25, uh, 256 megabytes and 1 GB. So rewriting a whole file because of one record being updated is very inefficient. It ex actually inc in increases your write amplification. This is where we started. Uh, but what we are going right now is a technology called merge and read, which basically means you have these basic parquet files, you start having delta files next to those, you put all these updates and deletes to those delta files, and you merge these two and do an asynchronous compaction only when you have enough data in the delta file to justify the rewrite. Uh, and this is what we are currently working on. Uh, at the same time, we are adding global indexing to Hoodie. So Hoodie, by default, has some version of indexing per partition. Uh, we are expanding that to be a global indexing across all the partitions. Uh, so I'll skip this to get to the lessons learned. Uh, okay, so in terms of lessons learned, and this is, I think, one of the, uh, again, it, is, it took us several years to learn this stuff. So I hope this is the main takeaway for you guys who are attending this talk. The first thing is, you need to study your data. We learn it the hard way. You need, you can't be there again. I was working at Apple at Twitter, so a lot of other folks work at other companies. So we, we, we knew how to be the big data platform. The problem is you can't just copy a data platform from one company to another company. It works to some extent. It's not the optimized long-term solution for your company. So you need to find the time, study your data, study the, data, the way the data is accessed, and design a solution based on that. You can obviously borrow ideas from other solutions, other companies, but you can't just copy the whole architecture over. Uh, so again, the good thing is for us is when we spend time studying our data, we build the platforms on top of the incremental ingestion and incremental processing of the data, that opens the door for us to support unexpected use cases. For example, GDPR came out after that. So, a big so we built this platform before GDPR was even uh, being discussed. So uh, the good thing with this approach is when you have the right primitives, when you can absorb, update, and delete, and something like GDPR comes in, uh, so you don't need to be worried about that. In our use case, uh, so they were, again, traditionally all the companies, they dump all the data in Hadoop, they deal with it later, they basically get rid of it with retention, some sort of retention, or they just leave it, let it leave, uh, leave there and they don't touch the data. With GDPR, you have to go and clean up the old data. You have to go and delete and update or obfuscate the data. Uh, so with us having the right primitives, having the capability for the users, I mean, data users inside the company to update the delete data. All we had to do is to provide these primitives to the, our security team, and they were basically able to go and update, clean, obfuscate all the historical data. So this is like why it's important to understand your data. Uh, the second takeaway is data quality is always an ongoing effort. You have to emphasize on that from the beginning. It's not some secondary problem that you tackle down the road. You have to start investing on that from the beginning. This is the main distinction between having a data swamp when you have tons of data and you can't make sense out of that uh, with, uh, compared to an effective data lake. Something that you can use on a daily basis can make the, the uh, data based, uh, data driven decisions uh, in, a, in an effective way. So one key uh, component of that is enforce schema as early as possible. We did a good job in defining uh, mandatory schemas from the beginning. It helps us a lot down the road to encourage users to use the platform because the data 
in Hadoop was of high quality, it was super easy for them to use them. Uh, but don't limit yourself to just mandatory uh, type schemas. Try, think about like higher level semantics. How we can enforce like more uh, uh, more granular semantics on top of these schemas. Again, uh, try to have take documentation very seriously. So it's easy to say, have defined these schemas when you have a few hundred tables. When you get to 20, 30,000 tables, these schemas are meaningless for users that are using them. Some stuff may make be, may seem obvious from the, at the beginning. Okay, the trip fare it seems okay, but then you start seeing the the business running different companies. The currency starts changing, so it becomes very problematic for the users to know what to expect from that. So make the documentation for all these schemas mandatory. Try to standardize everything. Again, the, when the moment you make, let the first exception happens, you're opening the door to a bunch of other exceptions to follow that. Do not make exceptions. Define your standard, your standard uh, at the same time, enforce them, and start educating users. So use, there's a very uh, blurry line between happy users and like angry users. So we had both, we dealt with both of them. So the moment, again, we provide the same platform. It's just how you educate the users. If they don't use it the right way, they get wrong answers, they make uh, wrong decisions, and then they start blaming you on having poor co low quality data. So edu have your standard defined, clearly defined, and educate users in terms of how they should uh, properly use them. Uh, Invest in the, again, enforce the retention policy. Uh, we didn't do that. We started with saying, okay, let's have everything there. We deal with the retention later. It's a big mindset change for the users. Uh, even if you want to start with a very generous retention, have that basically baked into your pipelines from the beginning so the users know, okay, we, there is a retention. For now, it's, let's say, 10 years forever, but at some point, it may change based on the cost of this data. It's very costly when you have raw data and all these mother data, data, data copied in Hadoops. Uh, at some point, you have to make a call and then get rid of some of the data. And if you don't have retention, uh, the idea of, okay, the data has some retention policy from the beginning, it's, you're gonna get a lot of pushback from the users uh, when you wanna delete the actual data. Uh, track all your metadata. The metadata is all the data about the data. So who is ingesting what data? What's the data lineage between these different tables? What is the data content? Who is accessing this data? The more the metadata that you have, later when you deal with unexpected issues, you can make more informed decisions. Invest in a good data pipeline monitoring. So you don't want users to report the, problem, the data issues for you. That leads to a several hundred thousands angry users. You want to catch the issues before the users are affected by that. A lot of times, small data issues will not immediately get reflected on the user size. They will use the data in an incorrect way. They make decisions that are not correct, and then later blame you because of that. So invest in a data pipeline, data monitoring. Uh, define your terminology in terms of, okay, what I mean, I, I keep using freshness and latency interchangeably in, the, in this presentation. Def these are very different terms. Define it whatever way that makes sense for you. Define freshness, latency, completeness, late arriving data. Define all your terminology and invest in a data monitoring that basically gives user visibility in terms of what you're providing. Minimize your pr um, platform dependency and user defined values. Again, you're almost always guaranteed for the users to break the agreement. Do not rely on that as a, in, your, in your platforms. Try to move away from user-defined values to system-defined values. A good example, we were used, relying on a TRIPS creation time that the user were filling to partition our data in Hadoop. A lot of times, users left it blank or they put it wrong values there. And we had to go and clean up and backfill the data. So we moved out of that, we rely on when that TRIPS basically happens at the source, gets recorded. There's a few seconds between the actual time that the user puts on there, where so when that uh, trips is recorded at the source data stores. That is much less trouble compared to the fact that uh, we are relying on, the, on, on a system defined values that is more more reliable, more robust, uh, and uh, long lasting. Uh, this, uh, and the last thing I want you guys to take away is the notion of time seems very obvious. It's basically when you talk about uh, large data, set, data sets and uh, like several hundred tables, it's very problematic for the users to use the correct notion of time. So define what you mean by time in uh, different places. You know, the notion of time for different, 
even within data pipelines, you have when the event happens, when the data was arrived, when you process the data, when you write the data, when you user query the data. These are all different notions of times. So make sure you clarify in, in terms of times what you provide at each step. 